Hi, I'm Amy Cardoso and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and our interviewer, Linda Mao, speaks with photography curator Malcolm Daniel about the photography in the exhibition, Degas, A New Vision. Now for Art This Week. I'm Linda Mao, and today I'm at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston speaking with their curator of photography, Malcolm Daniel, about the exhibition, Degas, A New Vision. My Malcolm, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Sure, my pleasure. So this exhibition has brought together several of the foremost scholars on Degas' work um, from across the globe. Would you tell me a little bit about the curators who you collaborated with for this exhibition? Sure. Uh, the two principal curators of the show are Gary Tintero, who's director of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and who was formerly the curator of uh, 19th century modern and contemporary art at the Metropolitan Museum. And um, Gary it, uh, was uh, the curator of the 1988 Dugas exhibition, which was uh, the great Dugas show for one generation. And this now is uh, the great gathering of Dugas' work for a new generation. And the principal uh, guest curator for the show is Henri Loiret, who was director of the Musée d'Orsay in Paris and then director of the Louvre mm -hmm. um, and a Degas scholar. And he's been thinking about the artist all his life, and this is the show in which he brings it all together. So we have the two foremost scholars of Degas' work, um, and both associated with uh, great museums and mm -hmm. able to uh, call in favors to bring the great pictures together here in Houston. And, but you yourself um, are uniquely qualified to uh, assist in the curation of this exhibition. Um, in addition to being an expert in 19th century photography, you did uh, curate an amazing exhibition of Degas photography um, back in 98 the, for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's right. Um, there is one room of photographs in the show, so the photography is a small part okay. of uh, of the exhibition and a small part of uh, Degas' work, but um, a surprising and revealing uh, part and something that I think will be a surprise to many people who don't know that Degas even made photographs. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this exhibition is the first time that many of these photographs have been shown since the 1998 exhibition. When you were looking into which ph photographs to select for this exhibition, did you take a similar approach to the exhibition back then, or did you um, try to think about it differently since it's in conjunction with all these other types of media? Actually, there are uh, fairly, uh, a fairly small number of photographs that survived by Degas, so we tried to bring as many as we could uh, to, the, to uh, the exhibition. Mm -hmm. There um, are two different kinds of photographs that you'll see. There are small contact prints, about three by four inches, uh, which Degas would have made himself by placing his glass negative directly on photographic paper and setting it in the sun until the paper darkened. A fairly simple process. Mm -hmm. um, he, you'll also see that there are photographs that are much larger, 11 by 15 inches or, or so. And for that, he would have needed the services of someone with an enlarger mm -hmm. and that someone was um, his art supplier, Guillaume Tassé, from whom he bought um, not only photographic materials but other art supplies, and uh, Tassé's daughter, Delphine, who, um, who Degas found particularly attractive mm -hmm. and liked working in the darkroom with, and she would do the enlarging following his directions. And you'll see, as you look in the exhibition, that sometimes um, we see a, the full picture on that contact print, mm -hmm. and then we can see Degas finding within that a more intense picture, find, finding the, the detail that is salient there. So um, there were decisions that were made in the dark room as he was making those enlargements. Do we know anything about how he learned these techniques and these processes, or if he was trained by anyone or sort of just picked it up on his own? Yeah, he actually asked Tasse, mm -hmm. his um, art and photography material supplier, for advice. So, for instance, in the summer of 1895, he was in the spa town of Mont d'Or, 
and he was uh, asking for plates of a certain size and, uh, and for advice. He said, you know, I want to take uh, pictures at twilight. How, you know, how, <laughs> give me advice about taking pic That's nighttime problem. views. That's a problem said, for modern day photographers. Right, he said <laughs> he tried to do it, tried to make landscapes at night and the moon moved, you know. So right. he's, he's experimenting. He's not really concerned about being a perfect craftsman. He's mm -hmm. not following the rules. He's not doing the kind of picture that the members of the photo club de Paris would make. Right. He's applying his own vision to a different medium mm -hmm. and experimenting with it. That brings me to another question. So none of these photographs, or Degas, let me say this, Degas never published or publicly exhibited photographs during his lifetime. That's to right. what extent, and of course we can't speak for him, but to what extent do we think that he considered these artistic experimentation or just exploration? No, I think, they, I think we um, definitely will see them as, as works of art mm -hmm. um, in another medium, um, but it was a private medium. It was not something that he um, exhibited during his lifetime. It wasn't published, so there's no criticism uh, from the period, but it was something that he shared with friends. Um, and, you know, remember that his sculptures, for instance, were not cast in bronze until after mm -hmm. his, his death. They were the waxes in his studio. They were part of his working method. We certainly consider those to be right. works of art. Um, and so uh, one could say the same about the photographs, that they were part of um, a process, a creative process for him. They were uh, things that he refined, mm -hmm. uh, that he explored, and that he shared with friends. Um, but it wasn't part of his public art. And, and I think that um, in a way it was also more than that. It, I think that Degas found a kind of spiritual content in photography and in the act of photographing in the same way that we still do. I mean, when we look at a photograph of a loved one, we feel mm -hmm. uh, a certain presence. And in a way, um, even a humble snapshot of somebody you really love might touch one more deeply than a painted portrait of that mm -hmm. person, even a, a well-painted portrait. Um, so Degas was connected to photography as a way of connecting with family and friends. His um, sister, um, Marguerite, was in um, uh, Buenos Aires, uh, ill. She had moved half a dozen years earlier. He shipped a camera off to her in August with instructions so that he could get a picture of her to hold on to that memory. Um, she passed away in October. Mm -hmm. um, their brother, Achille, had died two years earlier. And so photography was a way of connecting with a surrogate family, particularly his friends uh, Ludovic and Louise Alevi mm -hmm. and their sons Eli and Daniel. Um, and with his friends, uh, the poet Stéphane Mallarmé and the painter Auguste Renoir, mm -hmm. um, and others, others in a circle of artists and poets. Um, and so, uh, particularly in the evenings, when his mind might have dwelled on his own mortality, he was losing his eyesight, he was already getting old, um, he was thinking about a sister, other friends who had passed away. Uh, dinner at the Alevi home and photography afterwards put his mind someplace else and it, and it bound him to them in a, um, in a spiritual way, let's say. So um, during the days when there was daylight, he used the daylight time for sculpture and for pastel. In the evenings, uh, it was partly because his mind might be elsewhere, mm -hmm. feeling melancholy, but it was also because he wanted to control the light. So he said, um, you know, daylight is too easy. What I want is difficult. <laughs> I want the atmosphere of lamps and moonlight. So in, for instance, the famous picture of Degas and Mallarmé in the um, salon of Julie Manet, uh, where you see Degas and his camera reflected in the mirror the print that's in the exhibition uh, was given by uh, Mallarmé to his friend Paul Valéry, who inscribed on it that um, Mallarmé 
reported that it was a pose of 15 minutes and there were nine oil lamps spread around the room. So Degas is in absolute control of, of the setting. Mm -hmm. We have uh, accounts of him posing his people, you know, uh, tilt your head, no, tilt it more, put your leg up here, you know, and if they didn't do what he said, you know, he'd go over there and he'd move their leg the way he right. wanted it. Um, so he's absolutely in, in control of the, the picture and the, the poses and the lighting. Um, and uh, they're wonderful accounts. Um, the uh, elder son of Louise and Ludovic Alevi, Daniel Alevi, uh, in his diary wrote how um, these days uh, all of Degas' friends are afraid to ask him to dinner because you know what's coming. <laughs> Two hours of military obedience, um, right. you know, in, in the photographic sessions. Mm -hmm. um, but he also records that Degas, uh, at the end of the evening, would be intensely happy from the whole event. Right. So that brings me to something that's, it's kind of funny that uh, Degas' painting has been sometimes described as having a snapshot aesthetic. And so you, you hear that he's interested in photography and he has this dabbling in, in photography and you might assume that the photography informs that snapshot authentic, but the reality is completely different. Right, no, it, it <laughs> is interesting. And of course, Degas would have known about photography mm -hmm. much earlier in his life. You couldn't be living in Paris in the right. 1850s and 60s and 70s and 80s and not known about photography. But, um, that snapshot aesthetic that we think of is really a more of a 20th century aesthetic exactly. to begin with but it also is um and and by that we're talking about things like um uh framing and cropping right. and figures half cut mm -hmm. off or a strange perspective um but it's absolutely not what Degas right. chooses to do with photography it's a very deliberate mm -hmm. uh, kind of picture making exactly. that, he, that he, he does with photography. Uh, another pertinent aspect historically to the story is the ideas and the attitudes of Degas' contemporary um, audience to photography. And those attitudes have in a way caused problems for present day scholars in, in the areas of attribution and identifying a full body of work. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure, um, and I, uh, I think it's partly um, what we touched on a moment ago, which was that this was a private art for him, and so it wasn't something that was immediately recognizable as um, as something worth preserving in the way that almost every other scrap of paper in his studio at the time of his death um, was valued. Mm -hmm. So um, there were uh, great sales in 1918 and 19 of um, the contents of Degas studio. Um, the photographs were not cataloged and preserved and inventoried and itemized. Um, we know that there were photographs there. Right. We just don't know exactly what they were. We don't know what was lost. Um, there are various photographs that we know existed because we have um, them described in letters. Um, maybe they'll turn up at right. some point. Um, there are also photographs that uh, have been, uh, that are connected to Degas, uh, that are not in our show, but that relate in a much more direct one-to-one -one, uh, fashion with a couple paintings. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to believe that those were, you know, that there were only you know, two or three of those. We really imagine that that he would have been experimenting and, and using um, photography in a more seamless way uh, as part of the creative process. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think is interesting about Degas is the way he moves from one medium to the next. So he might um, make a monotype, which is um, just painting ink on a like an etching plate, not etching the plate, but just you know <laughs> right. painting with ink in a certain sense, sending it through the printing press, and then taking that print and putting it against another piece of paper and sending it through the press again so that he gets a counterproof. You mm -hmm. know, it's reversed and uh, slightly fainter. And then he might take pastel and work, work that up on pastel. Right. And then he might sort of trace that and use the composition on another picture. And 
So there are a few examples of photography being a part of that creative continuum. Mm -hmm. We just don't know how much was lost. And right. um, given the passion that he seemed to have for photography um, in the late 1890s, um, I guess I have high hopes that more will surface. And, and I will say that there are probably maybe eight or 10 pictures that have surfaced since the 1998 show. So uh, things are found in right. uh, a family armoire in Paris mm -hmm. and you know find their way to museums or to auction houses. And so there are, uh, we're still learning things. Finally, I just want to point out that an exhibition um, of this scope and the scholars of this caliber um, really might be a once-in-a-lifetime experience for a lot of people, and this is the only destination or the only venue in the United States, that's correct? That's right. It was co-organized with the National Gallery of Australia, mm -hmm. um, and uh, Houston is the only venue for mm -hmm. it, and indeed many of the pictures that are here are ones that um, seldom leave their right. their place on the walls of the great museums or or private collections, and so it's an incredible opportunity. I would say, um, if not a once in a lifetime, it's a one, certainly a once in a generation right. uh, opportunity. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today. My pleasure. We want to thank Malcolm for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to mfah.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polo.